Well, thank you again for everyone coming. But I, um, we're, we want to continue the conversation about um, foundational competencies and how do we assure that or uh, take steps to assure that our students are gaining uh, um, co foundational competencies um, through their educational experiences here at the University of Maine. This is, of course, uh, um, a continuation of a conversation that's been going on for a, a, a quite a while. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to do a very quick thumbnail of sort of at least most recently getting to this point. So a few years ago when we put out our strategic plan, uh, one area that drew a lot of attention was um, how is the university going to invest? What, what, was, what were our ideas about investment, particularly in faculty lines? And the phrase in that um, that was used was that the university is going to invest in, uh, in signature areas of excellence and emerging areas of distinction, or something to that effect. And that led to a, a very interesting discussion about what, what are our signature areas, what are our emerging areas. The faculty senate sent a letter to, um, I don't think it's to the president, or but it was directed to the strategic planning group with some ideas about how to identify these signature and emerging areas. But included in that letter was also this kind of call to pay attention to foundational areas as well. And it was a great point, the idea that we can't build a great university if we're only talking about our, the tip to the point of where, well, where we're headed, that, that our, our, uh, our task at the university is uh, uh, multifaceted. And, and it's essential that we uh, look at the areas that are foundational. Last year, as you all know, we had a, a campus-wide discussion about identifying signature and emerging areas. We had a process that involved a, a lot of uh, uh, folks in that, in that uh, process. And I thought it was successful uh, in that we, we, uh, we have identified areas and, and talked about what that means. I will admit that last year I, I ambitiously thought we could also try to tackle this issue of foundational and how do we assure that, that um, we are investing in foundational areas as well. And, um, uh, wiser heads in my office, Robin primarily you know, said, are you crazy? This is... So we said, all right, let's just start this conversation and put a little more focus, move it, a, move it ahead and we'll focus a, a little uh, further down the line. So we said, well, this year, this coming year, which is now, uh, we'll spend some time focusing on that and thinking about, again, how do we identify and how do we figure out the best ways to invest, the best ways to assure and support our education uh, so that students are leaving uh, with strong foundational competencies. We did do some homework uh, to help prepare for that. We, uh, we looked at the, the, um, uh, the sort of the national picture. Uh, I'll thank Robin, I'll thank uh, Jeff St. John for uh, helping with that. Um, we uh, started to look at, you know, begin the national conversation. I had been aware of, and I'm sure many of you were, that the AACU had come up with a report now almost 10 years ago uh, about liberal education and America's promise and that they've done some work on identifying what they thought were uh, core foundational competencies uh, that, that uh, a university education um, should provide or that students should, should achieve. And um, we were curious about well, what's happened in that, uh, since then, the publication of them. And of course, there's been a lot that's going on, uh, subsequent reports and development of thinking about how do we, how do we evaluate those, those areas. Last fall, we had a conversation in this room uh, in October uh, about foundational competencies. And the framework for that conversation was the LEAP report. And I asked uh, several faculty members, and so to those of you who are here, oh, I'm sorry, this is to get you to think where we are and how we're going back in time now to October. <laughs> image. And in October, um, we had this conversation in the faculty forum here, uh, and I, I brought some faculty in uh, to reflect on the, the, the uh, LEAP report, uh, the outcomes identified uh, in the LEAP report, and reflect a little bit on their experience and understanding at the University of Maine. And kind of the questions were sort of, uh, how are we doing, and, and uh, how well um, do we think, anyway, our students' experiences uh, uh, our experience, you know, student experiences prepare them or help them to develop these competencies. I'm going to provide you what I would think with sort of the summary take home uh, points from that conversation, but I don't want you to just take my word for it. So I'm sorry, here's the panel uh, of folks who participated. Uh, I won't run through them, but you, you recognize your, your friends and colleagues here. Uh, a faculty panel, as well as uh, Brian Dorr, who's our director of, uh, of assessment at the university. And again, we had representation from, from across campus. 
and again, really, I, the, these folks commented, and I thought we had a very good interchange uh, with the folks in attendance around this topic. So as I said, I'll provide a summary, but, but before I do that, uh, I'll let you to the, hear what some of them uh, said. My reaction to the, uh, the LEAP outcomes, of course, like my colleagues here, I thought they were fabulous. Uh, I, would, uh, um, I didn't see any holes, uh, nor did I see anything that I would want to see removed. Uh, I think at the University of Maine, through the general education requirements that we have, we actually already have a framework in place uh, that we could nicely align with those outcomes. Well, first of all, those outcomes are great. Wouldn't it be fabulous if everybody who left the University of Maine had competence in every one of those areas that was up there? And there may be a few that someone might put, oh, that shouldn't be in there, or one or two that might be missing. But overall, that would be just fabulous. And then I thought, I think the University of Maine does quite a good job providing, in general, many opportunities for students to gain these competencies. But I don't have, as a single faculty member, much of a sense at all as to how our students are actually doing on acquiring those competencies, either by availing themselves of the actual opportunities, whether they're classwork or you know, volunteerism or international study abroad or the International Culture Fest or whatever it happens to be, how they spread out their gen ed requirements, but I don't even know, even if they sort of sample from all of those, whether they're actually attaining the competencies that are up there. Yes, I think these values, uh, practices that LEAP has identified are fantastic. And I think that uh, the University of Maine is doing wonderfully at implementing them in a variety of ways. I think we can look at our coursework, we can look at programs uh, outside of our coursework that are interdisciplinary, service learning, and we see that we are regularly involved in what I'm going to use as overarching uh, terms <coughs> of all seven of these principles in engaged reflection. One of the, the ideas that, again, I think is so central in this project is that they talk about higher education and education in general as being towards the end of life, work, and citizenship. So as long as we are educating students to learn you know, to get um, certain assessment checks in a box, and you know, yep, I've got that BA or that BS. We've missed the point. We need to be working on helping students to become people who can live well, who can work well, who can be good citizens. Okay. So what I, again, what we took in terms of looking at the summary of the, the comments, what you heard there, was, uh, you know, I, the folks looked at and uh, reflected on the, the, the outcomes identified in the LEAP report, but the, um, the reflection was positive. That, that, was, that, that, that those seemed to be uh, you know, uh, important and, and, and essential. However, um, that, and that shouldn't be sort of surprising, right? That the LEAP report wasn't just you know, knocked off in, in a half an hour. They put a lot of time in conversation with faculty from around the United States. <coughs> there was a view that the University of Maine were doing all right, that is that there's a lot happening, a lot of good work going toward providing students with the opportunities to develop these competencies. That, that our faculty, by and large, care about this, that we're, we're uh, invested in helping our students to develop this. But there was a theme running through the discussion about not knowing exactly how well we're doing. Right? How do we know our students are learning and developing critical thinking skills? I think most, most of us, and including myself, in, thinking back in my teaching, uh, like to think that we're helping students to develop uh, critical thinking um, skills. Uh, but how do we know? And do we, you know, are we achieving that? If we are, is it only with 20% uh, of the students or with most of the students? Uh, so what do we mean by that? And as I already mentioned, there's a generally positive reaction to the, um, uh, to the LEAP report. So this focus on foundational competencies, I guess, that th a illustrate uh, why we're really uh, attending to it now. It's part of our strategic plan. The faculty said it, again, helped us by it to, to, to sort of say, look, don't, don't lose track of what's important and, and core. And we had this faculty forum where there was a consensus that, these, that the, um, the LEAP uh, framework was valuable for us to consider as we look at, at, at uh, how we're doing here at the University of Maine. But of course, there are other there are other um, factors that are impinging on us as an institution that are um, moving in the same direction or saying also these are important things to, to look at. One is accreditation, right? So 
Uh, we are accredited, as you know, by uh, NEASC, New England Association of Schools and Colleges. This is from the NEASC standard uh, about general education requirements, what they are, they're coherent and sub substantive, blah, 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 I can, I'll let you read that. We're in, we're um, in a, again, right about the midpoint, maybe just actually just past the midpoint of our, um, of our, accredit our accreditation mm -hmm. cycle. We submitted a, an interim report and we provided them an update on how we're doing in, in, as, an, as a university evaluating student learning outcomes. And they said, thank you very much. In their reply to President Ferguson, they said, look, by spring 2019, I want you to give emphasis on your continued implementation of your plan about evaluating student learning outcomes and using, and how do you use these outcomes to inform and make changes as an institution. So, in addition then to our own internal focus of saying this is important, uh, our accrediting agency is, is saying it's important. <coughs> it's not just NEASC as well. Uh, you know, in, in the, the provost job, you get to meet accrediting bodies from all around campus. So whether it's AACSB for, for a business or ABET uh, in engineering um, and other areas, there's this theme of looking at how do you know that you're, you're achieving the goals that you say you are for your, uh, for your students first question they always want to know. The second is, how are you using what you learn from that assessment to make changes and modify your curricula and, and, uh, and improve uh, your student learning outcomes? So we're hearing it from, from the accrediting agencies. We feel it's important as an institution. After the October uh, forum, uh, uh, I asked Brian to do some more hunting around what's going on again nationally with respect to uh, the LEAP report and these student learning outcomes. And, um, you know, let's see if we can take that further. We felt like we got an endorsement from the, from the discussion at the October meeting that this was a good way to go. What can we use? We don't want to reinvent the wheel. What can we use? Uh, uh, what's happened uh, nationally? Brian identified it. Uh, something called the Multi-State Collaborative Project. I'll, I'm gonna let the <coughs> team um, Kirsten come up and tell you about that in a minute. But we, um, Brian and Kirsten went to uh, a, a national meeting about the Multi-State Collaborative uh, Project, which is an effort to figure out a, a, what they think they call a values rubric or a rubric for evaluating learning outcomes, the ones they've identified. Through that uh, participation in that meeting, and I think because they are so um, such nice, charming, interesting people, uh, Brian and Kirsten, uh, we were contacted and invited to join the collaborative. The collaborative was set up with nine states uh, to, uh, to work on this together. They asked the University of Maine as an institution to join. They, 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 uh, are, it wasn't just us, they've asked a few other areas. Uh, um, West Virginia? Texas. Texas. It's actually just Maine and Texas. Maine, Texas. Yeah. They've asked to, to join, um, and they, you know, we were very interested. I was very um, struck by this opportunity. It seemed great. I'm going to again have them tell you uh, more about it. I talked uh, uh, with uh, Mick Peterson in his role as uh, president of the faculty senate. Um, he also thought it was a good idea. We took it to the faculty senate um, executive committee, and, and I think received endorsement. Uh, 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 for pursuing this. And so we signed off uh, in January on participating, uh, we signed an MOU to be part of this multi-state um, uh, multi collaborative. So, to complete my little diagram, we've got our own uh, institutional priority that said we should look at that. We've got accredited agencies saying, hey, we think it's a good idea for you to look at that. And now we've got this fabulous opportunity uh, through the multi-state collaborative I'll let the well, ACU, you know, I'll let um, Ryan tell you what SHEO is. Um, but there's funding through the Gates Foundation, and through our participation in the collaborative, we'll be able to access some of that funding to help us to carry out this work. So we really have a great opportunity here uh, to really move the discussion forward about um, general education at the University of Maine, about how well we're doing at helping students meet foundational uh, competencies, so that we are laying the groundwork we're looking at how do we how do we invest? Where are we going to? Where do we need to put resources? Where is the where are we going to likely get the best bang for the buck? 
uh, in putting our resources in? How can we um, in intelligently or, or rationally uh, move forward uh, as an institution? So that's the background. At this point, I'm going to ask Brian and Kirsten to come on up and uh, take over from here and, and, and uh, fill us in a little bit more detail about the multi-state collaborative. My uh, responsibility here is to tell you a little bit about the multi-state collaborative and uh, and my experience of uh, going and witnessing some of the activities that it's involved in. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so the multi-state collaborative, which is a very generic sounding term, is really a, a group of states coming together in an attempt to try to find working ways of implementing the assessment uh, strategies that align with the LEAP uh, project. Uh, it is in, they've just completed their first year of work, uh, and it's really a pilot project that is bringing together all sorts of uh, engaged minds, educators, administrators, to see how could we actually turn this into an assessment uh, protocol uh, that will do something that we think is worthwhile. Uh, the, the key to me is that being grounded in the, in the LEAP uh, foundational uh, areas. They're looking at questions about uh, liberal education uh, and how we can work on developing students who are uh, healthy and successful in terms of their ability to have not only good, you know, careers and education, you know, in an intellectual uh, way, but also as citizens, as people who have families and so forth. So. The, the real key, I think, is that this is a group of people trying to find an assessment tool that's not just going to end up with some numerical data that is sort of empty of meaning. Um, so they've been working for about a year together. There are 70 participating institutions right now in nine and now potentially 10 and 11 states uh, with the joining of Maine and Texas. Uh, and um, these people are working together to try out this uh, sample protocol. Um, Can we go to the next slide? Yes, that would be great. <coughs> so now the question is, you know, what is the advantage for the University of Maine in joining in on this? Um, uh, so for the, the first thing I think, you know, as came up in the panel uh, in the fall, people are very interested and intrigued by these uh, leap principles and the sense that they are really trying to capture something that is meaningful to us to assess in areas such as uh, quantitative and qualitative literacy, critical thinking, citizenship, global uh, awareness, and so forth. Uh, but again, the question is, well, how do we actually turn that into rubrics that we can measure uh, successfully and then respond to successfully? So these, um, uh, the folks that are participating in the MSC have already done a year's worth of work on the basis of work that has been being done through the LEAP principles for 10 years. So we have a great opportunity to uh, step in and really uh, take advantage of hard work that people have been doing in already building a model and setting up a framework for how to partake in this assessment, uh, where this assessment is about deepening and um, uh, helping us to further uh, develop our student learning and to get a sense of what our student learning is about. Um, uh, so one of the things that I think is most interesting about this method, just as a, a quick further articulation of how this protocol is working, is the it, it's not going to be something that requires us to reinvent how we are doing our assignments. The, the LEAP initiative, as well as the MSC, is committed to using uh, what they call authentic assessment. So they will be taking types of assignments that we are already using in our classes and uh, helping us to find ways to develop uh, assessment tools that match up with that, rather than having us you know, take some test that has nothing to do with our curriculum and just have our students taking it. Um, so that to me seems like a really valuable piece of it is that they want to be working with our uh, assignments that we think are already valuable assignments. Uh, and uh, we benefit from uh, the, the rubrics that they already have in place, the tools that they've been developing for doing this. And then I think one <coughs> very important thing is this isn't just a method for us to look internally at our own uh, student work. 
we are also going to have access through this multi-state collaborative to external evaluators who could give us an assessment of our student work from outside of our university. Uh, and we can use that however we would like. That seems like a, a fairly valuable thing in my mind in the sense that it has a little bit of extra clout to have an outside viewpoint on our materials in addition to having our own eyes on those materials. Um, the, the end result of that will be, we hope, to um, give us access to a sense of how we are doing in various systems uh, or areas, departments, um, um, what, what's the, departments, areas, and the university as a whole around these various um, um, measurement sites, whether we're talking about quantitative or qualitative assessment, it will give us a sense of how we're doing as a whole and how we're also doing at a smaller level. Uh, as Jeff said, that is going to help us, um, you see how we're doing <laughs> as a university and within certain departments, and that will uh, give uh, the university a sense to help us determine where money goes, not just to give the gold stars to areas that are doing well, but as I understand it, to say, ah, we really do need to actually buttress, uh, you know, work on, you know, writing or uh, quantitative literacy uh, across the university. We need to give some funding to support uh, and bolster these areas because we're not doing as well as we would like. Uh, so certainly it will help us with, uh, as far as I understand, with university assessment of where funds go, but it will also give us relatable uh, data to talk with outside folks, to legislators, to the public, um, to uh, NIASC, of course, uh, and other accreditation um, um, bodies, and also to employers. One of LEAP's big concerns is that they uh, are interested in sh uh, helping uh, educators to translate how what we do in the university is valuable to uh, employers. And so I think having that piece will help us uh, to show our relevancy um, not, you know, on, on many different levels. Um, uh, as Jeff also said, the advantage of being involved in this is not only that we have a pool of people who are already working very hard and have expertise and have made mistakes and learned from those already, but there are also, at this point, external funding possibilities. And I know that one big concern as faculty members is, you know, well, where, how, how am I going to be able to support this extra work that I'm going to do to be able to uh, partake in this assessment uh, mechanism? And at this point, you know, we're hoping that there will be some funding that will come through to support us in doing that. Um, uh, and I think, lastly, uh, I want to just note that this is an exploratory project that really is driven by educators. My one big concern, and I voiced this at the meeting, was um, it looked like there were a lot of administrators around the table at this meeting, and I don't want to feel as an educator like I'm just doing something to please or answer to uh, administrators. And uh, I, there was almost a roar in the room of people saying, no, 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 we all started as educators. We are educators. That's where our heart is. LEAP and um, the Multi-State Collaborative is about people who are teaching, committed to teaching, who want to find ways of assessing their work, uh, not only as individual teachers, but as universities and departments, uh, to help us see how we can do better and continue to make sure that we stay relevant. Um, and they are trying to figure out various ways to make that happen effectively. And our joining in on that, I think, gives us a chance to really try to explore and see what we can do. With the nice uh, option that if it doesn't work for us, this is not a binding situation. Uh, we have signed on for the, um, the MOU, the uh, Memorandum of Understanding, that we will try this out for a year. Uh, and we will see what works for us and what doesn't. Uh, and this seems like a great, um, it seems like the best thing that I've seen uh, in terms of trying to figure out how to do this. So I think it's an exciting opportunity um, and looks promising. I do want to say that uh, as disappointed as I am that to learn that a person wouldn't want to do this just to please an administrator, I still am pleased that this presentation. So um, uh, the promos asked me if I would consider what would this look like uh, if we were to do this this year? So what would be the kind of the sequence of events? What would be the kind of things that we would need to do? 
And so, uh, I, one, I went and I looked back at what were the expectations for the first cohort of institutions that were part of year one of the MSC pilot. And, and really just trace those same things through and, and attach a timeline to it. And I think you can divide the, the parts of this into three basic elements. The, the first is around recruitment and kind of information dissemination. And this is sort of step one in that process. Um, maybe step 1A, because we, we signed the MOU in January, and now we're really trying to roll this out and talk about, you know, what does this mean? What, what does it mean for us to potentially become involved with this? You know, who could get involved? What, what are the parameters? Um, and so I think if you look here under the three different SLOs that are the target of this study, although there are 16 different competencies that are outlined under the LEAP standards and, and are further detailed in the value rubrics, there are only three that are addressed in this study. And, and the intent of that um, is so that we, we place some limits around you know, the nature of this. Um, thinking about core competencies at their most core level, quantitative uh, literacy, um, critical thinking, and written expression. And because these are things that are embedded ac across pretty much all disciplines um, and, and throughout a student's academic career, uh, the, the intent in this study is to look at what is the achievement of students in approximately their third year of achievement, or their third year, excuse me, of their education in, in a four-year degree. Now, there's a parallel process happening for students in two-year institutions um, that are also part of the MSC, um, and where they're looking at, you know, where are those folks after their third semester. Um, so, if we go to the next slide. So here we are, we're in this first stage of, of recruitment, thinking about who wants to be involved. And I, and I think from a, a broad perspective, um, looking again at this recruitment and selection of interested faculty, thinking about those folks who teach courses related to these areas. And so Jen Tyne and I had an interesting conversation earlier today, and she's like, you know, I just don't know that we're gonna have enough math faculty that are gonna be interested in fulfilling, you know, 10 faculty slots on this. And I said, well, you know, actually, the, the, this, this idea of quantitative reasoning or quantitative literacy is it cr cuts across almost all disciplines, I would say all disciplines, and there are meaningful ways for folks who are in economics, and uh, Mario's going to talk today, but, but also in any of the sciences or any of the social sciences or in education. Um, I think all of those folks have something to potentially contribute, uh, and, and so our hope is that there are, there are individuals, there are individual faculty who are teaching you know, a statistics course, for example. Um, I'm teaching a course right now, and uh, it, you know that process in thinking about what are my students learning and what are the kind of quantitative reasoning skills that they're demonstrating uh, has been a great, you know, sounding board for me as I'm thinking about doing this work. So, going forward, looking looking ahead, so if we can identify faculty, and I think we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 30-ish faculty. Uh, spread across these three areas, written expression, quantitative reasoning, and critical thinking, um, to come together or to, to at least I indicate their, their interest. Um, and come together later this spring and start to talk about how do our existing gen ed descriptions already align with the value rubrics and with the LEAP uh, learning outcomes. And, it's really the case that very much what we already have in place is almost a direct translation. Now, there are points at which you know, there, are, there are differences, and there are, I suspect, many more things that are embedded in the, in the LEAP standards than are in our gen ed um, you know, descriptions. But the, the, the essence of it is, is almost a direct translation. So having folks come together and talk about you know, how does that look? What, what are the things that we would focus on as being the, the most plausible links between our documents and this national set of documents? And then moving from that to some more specifics and thinking about, you know, what are the exact courses that would be good candidates to be part of this pilot? So, you know, what is the statistics course or what is the philosophy course maybe thinking about critical thinking? Um, and then moving from that to some yet more specifics, what are the what are the exact assignments in those courses that would be good candidates for inclusion? Um, and so over the process, over the course of this summer, really identifying what those what who those faculty are, what the courses are, and what the assignments might be, 
And so that for next fall, and this is the next slide, Corvus Hacker, um, we would then be able to, we would teach our courses, we would give our assignments as we normally do, um, we would collect those assignments from students, and we would upload those as our, our artifacts, is what they call them, to uh, the MSC. And our artifacts would be de-identified to the scores, and you know, the task stream, the, the vendor would know. And there wouldn't, there's no cost to Humane for participating, and we should receive a, some amount of money, although we don't know exactly what, to help support faculty work in doing this. But what, we, what I think we get out of this is we get this sense of being part of this larger conversation and certainly part of the discussions of the same kinds of issues and challenges that other institutions that are having with this. Um, but also, as, as Kirsten mentioned earlier, we get this, this feedback and we can see, you know, where, how does this look? You know, how does this sampling plan look? Um, I know in an earlier conversation, Francois, um, as part of the assessment advisory board discussions talked about, well, what is our sampling plan? Or how could we sample and think about looking at our students' general education, you know, progress or outcomes? And I think one of the things that we might get out of this, one of the things that I'm really interested in is what are the processes that the MSC folks who have spent a lot of time and a lot of Gates money thinking about this with, with input from, you know, recognized researchers, thinking about the sampling plan and how to identify good ways to collect data that give us accurate, meaningful information about the institution, or maybe about departments and programs, not necessarily. I think that will be really dependent on what individual groups you know, want out of this process. So again, this is all very tentative, but these are the basic elements that other institutions went through when they went through the first year and would presume that we would have a very parallel sort of process that we would go through. All right, thank you. Okay. So, as you can tell from the, the, the outline and, and what you've learned so far about about, uh, about the multi-state collaborative and what it would mean for University of Maine um, uh, to join, uh, this uh, this process would involve significant faculty uh, engagement. Um, and uh, again, I'm very pleased and would thank the uh, faculty senate for their positive response to this uh, when, we, when we brought them to them. This isn't something that we can do from Alumni Hall. We need, uh, we need, you know, we want to be partners in this. And again, Brian's office um, in the assessment will play a central role. Uh, but we need, we need for this to succeed to have faculty uh, engaged in this in a meaningful way. So, what I want to do is have a conversation about this. But I'm going to see the conversation bit by asking a few people. I'd ask a few people uh, to come up and make a, uh, a few comments about their reaction. I've got a couple of questions. I'll show you. Uh, that I've asked them to think about, and uh, just to start the conversation. Um, so, if I can ask these three people, you've got uh, Dylan Dreyer from English, Jen Klein who, uh, from Math and Mathematics and Statistics, and Mario Teisel, who's a uh, professor and director of the School of Economics. Um, you know, to pander to them for a moment, I try to think about faculty who are engaged in the uh, in this kind of work. About you know, I know from you know, conversations, informal conversations, you know. Uh, care very deeply about um, about the kind of education our students are, are getting. Think innovatively about um, about the way they teach and the way their units are or are not uh, achieving their goals. So uh, fortunately, and uh, they all, all agreed. And you know, I gave them very short notice uh, on this. I think I asked you Monday afternoon. Monday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, to so again, this, what I uh, was hoping is that um, really just to kind of start the conversation, I asked them to share some comments, and then the next place we will go is just to open it up for uh, for some discourse with everyone here. So these are the questions I asked them to think a little bit about. Um, is a framework. <laughs> I told them to feel free to stray, but the framework. How might the involvement in the multi-state collaborative support? your students, your unit, or your own work, and uh, what do you think might be the greatest challenges to implementation? Um, so, with that, uh, um, I'll ask Dylan, can you start? <laughs> I spent all of my time with the um, <clears throat> written communication uh, rubric, of course, um, and I guess I'll just frame what I have to say about that in uh, terms of values 
that my discipline has um, for uh, reliable and valid writing assessment. Um, the value rubric for written communication is, is pretty good. Uh, it's as good, I think, as anything produced <coughs> by this many people can be. Um, it, um, it is what we call a rhetorically based rubric um, in that it, it asks, it, it asks, it's going to be asking readers to attend to things like students' ability to, to attend to context and purpose, uh, genre, disciplinary conventions, which as we know differ dramatically, if not incompatibly, from discipline to discipline. Um, I will also point out that the uh, value rubric roughly, not precisely, but roughly aligns with faculty respondents to the 2011 uh, survey on the state of student writing uh, at UMaine. Um, it identifies a number of things that those faculty said were important and also identifies a number of things that faculty said their advanced undergraduates were not very good at. So, um, the, uh, the, the process, as I see, is also fairly accessible, which is the second criteria, um, and that I am a little thin on some of these details, but it appears to me that the data produced from the assessment will be accessible, accessible not just to administrators, but also to faculty and, one would hope, to students themselves. Now, as for the other, uh, so two out of five, ain't bad. Um, the other criteria for really reliable and valid writing assessment is that it's site-based, locally controlled, and context sensitive. Um, I, I'm curious about how that's going to play out um, as far as the, uh, the value rubric. I would have preferred, for instance, that these traits came from language, or came from our language, right? That, that, they, that we had articulated what we were looking for in student writing, um, because there will be, of course, some cost in borrowing this rubric, which we are not free to change for our local assessment. Um, but if that ultimately works around to having a conversation that we need to have anyway about how we know what we're doing and are, are our students able to perform at the level we need to perform, it may well be worth, it may well be worth that cost. Thank you. Uh, Jen, would you sure. Mind? Um, let's see, first a little background with what the math department's doing. And I, I did mention to Brian that we, it would be hard, a hard sell to get lots of faculty involved, but I in no way meant that uh, quantitative literacy was just a math issue. Um, the department for years has been calling for uh, quantitative literacy across the curriculum, recognizing um, that it has a place in many, many disciplines. Um, so when the math gen ed requirements switched to the quantitative literacy requirements, um, that was the first step. Uh, and I worked with Brian last summer developing a rubric um, that went was directly tied to the learning outcomes that we have in our uh, quantitative literacy gen ed um, requirements. I think there's six of them. Um, so we went through, Brian and I, a similar process to put together a rubric. Um, I definitely wouldn't call it a direct translation to the rubric that, that LEAP has. <laughs> Um, there's definitely some areas of overlap with the two. Um, so that was an interesting project. Um, unfortunately, uh, well, it is, it's stuck on every one of our syllabi for our gen ed classes um, in quantitative literacy, at least in the math department. Um, but the next step is actually what to do with it. And I think that's the most exciting part of this collaborative is to um, tap into people around the country who are actually taking the next step. Um, it, it's a challenge in our department um, because I think about 80% of our gen ed classes are taught by adjuncts. Um, so they're, they're not invested in, in the process like this into actually making the next step and actually assessing our students' work um, using such a rubric. Um, and also, I think you know, the gen ed courses, the quantitative literacy courses are taught um, mostly to first and some second year students. And the LEAP um, project, from what I know from the online stuff I read, is, like Brian said, assesses students at more like the third or fourth year of their studies. Um, so I'm not sure that gen ed courses are the right spot to do this assessment um, for the quantitative literacy. But like I said, I think anything that we learn um, from this collaborative, we can take back and use for not only, quanti not only these gen ed um, learning outcomes, but course specific outcomes as well, which 
we as a department need to do a better job on as well. Um, and it's great to hear that there's some outside funding on that as well for faculty involvement, because otherwise it's just one more thing we're asked to do um, and add to our list. So that was good to hear. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll kind of go off, off of your comments. Um, and I'll, I'll start by first saying that uh, we were already doing assessment uh, in School of Economics, but only in terms of content, economic content. Uh, we did not, although we do teach gen ed courses, or gen ed qualified courses, uh, both in terms of writing intensive, ethics, uh, social, um, and quantitative literacy, um, we've never included that as part of our assessment matrix and really having in-depth discussions about what that means in terms of program. Um, clearly, we do a lot of work in terms of critical thinking, inquiry, uh, information literacy, a lot, of the, a lot of the values rubrics. We hit many of them, but we never documented that. Um, so uh, some of our gen ed courses are gen ed 100 level courses, but many of of the courses that we teach that currently qualify for gen ed are also at the three and 400 level. So um, it was um, after the October meeting, when we were, had leaves on the trees, um, where you talked about the LEAP report, and I was way in the back and I was going, what the frig is that? I had no idea what that was. It was the LEAF report. The, the LEAF report, report. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, so I went, found it and I looked at all the value rubrics and I'm like, my God, we do a lot of this stuff. Um, and so um, even before being, even before Monday, <laughs> we, had, we had already um, had a couple faculty meetings where we talked about the need to expand what, what we do in terms of our assessment, um, not just to look at, you know, did you teach about the theory of the firm in this class or not? Um, and so we, we built it, built all those value uh, metrics in. Um, all the faculty got copies of the, the rubrics and the definitional stuff. And they're in the process, we've got about half the courses already. Faculty have gone and checked off the boxes. And, and it's more than to check off because um, we look, we've always done our assessments based on does it introduce a concept, reinforce a content, <laughs> or, or uh, get to mastery mm -hmm. uh, of a concept. So um, we're doing the same thing in, in sort of those gen ed metrics as well, the value metrics. So, um, you know, we were already kind of moving that way after the October one, and then to find out on Monday that, oh, there's this. This, this organization we're going to work with and all that. I was like, wow, perfect timing. So. Thank you. Um, so you know, my one quick uh, observation, and again, when we're talking about uh, learning outcomes and we talk about gen ed, at least I, 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 in my 28 and a half years here, I've always assumed that, you know, that, that, we, that they're not the exact same, that is, we think, at least I've always thought, Students develop quantitative literacy through math courses and when I taught psychology courses and economics courses and uh, sociology courses and other, other areas. So it is that what one of the things that's appealing to me is that it's the fact that when I spoke to the person at multi-state collaborative, I, I said, well, I kind of actually Jen was along the lines. I'm not sure how many math courses we have at the 400 level that get it. She said, no, that's not that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the economics sociology, history courses, and work samples that would come out of those courses that we would then look and say, have your students developed quantitative literacy or, or writing competency or, or, or the ability to think critically? And that, for me, was one of the really appealing things about this. It, it's not an evaluation of the gen ed courses. It's an evaluation of the education here at UMaine, you know, writ large or, or, or uh, come together and how we're, whether or not or how well we're achieving um, uh, these kinds of outcomes. I found that very appealing. Um, so let me throw it open for uh, questions. I'll ask you guys, if you don't mind, just to stay up here. Um, and uh, and uh, questions, comments, I, I, I want to talk eventually a little bit about 
challenges to implementation, but, but let me first uh, just open the floor for, for questions or reactions to what you've learned about your students today. <laughs> Actually, I'm very interested in that last question that you had on yeah. about the implementation, and I think um, going beginning in Brian's course about curriculum assessment, um, and he, he brought up my question when he talked about sampling. So how do you sample different classes? And, and I think my question is how do you handle, or how are we going to handle um, what you assess in a classroom of 200 versus what you assess in a classroom of 20. Because there's clearly a difference in how effective you are at teaching or how effective even students are at reception depending upon class size. So. Uh, want to take a shot at that? Um, well, I think that's one of the things that's interesting in being part of this collaborative is that because there's 10,000 pieces of student work that are being collected, and they're being collected across a broad range of courses and course sizes and assessment types, that one of the things that will be part of the, the, the benefit of being involved with this is the opportunity to see how do those different uh, methods play out in terms of the effectiveness of, of being able to measure these, these kinds of outcomes. Um, that's something we simply could not do, I don't think, here at the university with, you know, without an enormous amount of work. And so this is almost like a sampling plan, if you will, across all of these 70 or some odd universities, pulling all of that data together and saying, okay, so here, here are some things that clearly appear to work, or maybe clearly appear to work, and here are other things that maybe are not working as well. And, and, and actually, in listening to the conference calls from this, group already and, and listening to the kinds of issues that are coming up, there are people that are identifying, oh, you know what, this assignment we thought was going to work well, mm, not so much, and it's going to be a real problem. Um, I, I think, again, just the benefit of that and, and dipping our toes in without fully committing to doing this institution-wide <coughs> is, is an opportunity to learn. Christine? And, I mean, I, for some people, you know, for me at least, just having any vague sense of how this would work, um, it, it might be helpful just to, to give you a tiny sense of what we learned it might look like. So you might have an assignment, and you um, give the assignment to this uh, uploaded system, and you also are asked to write a bit of a contextual piece of information about the assignment, what its expectations are, if there's any <coughs> background knowledge, the greater of the assignment needs to have in order to be able to assess it well. And there's a, there are a range of questions. And speaking a bit to Dylan's point, you don't have to sign on to have your assignment scored on each question. And there's a bit of room, if I recall, for you to be able to personalize it to some extent. Um, so there, there is an ability, like if something is just not appropriate for an assignment, you're able to play with that a little bit. And maybe not radically, but it doesn't seem as you know, um, sort of tight or generic as you might fear. So I think there, there is going to be some way for us to play with it. But also, yeah, I mean, I like the point that it might not work for everything. And we will be learning what works and what doesn't work from this process. Chris Well, um, I guess I'd, I want to say one thing, a couple of things. One is that I, I'm very excited that to see an assessment process that really gets integrated into the values that we have as an institution. Um, I guess the maybe slightly provocative thing I want to say is that uh, I'll trot out my pyramid metaphor. Um, if you have a very sharp pyramid with, let's say, signature emerging at the top of that pyramid and it gets too sharp, we end up with a very unstable foundation. So I, I want to make sure we think about articulating those values and almost have a, another team or part of this team thinking about articulating those values that that promote the foundational areas and not simply quantitatively assess them. There's, there's this rhetorical and articulate or process of articulating what those are, why this is important, that shouldn't be overlooked as we assess. So that, that's maybe a provocative in this context, but I'll, I'll offer that. Thank you. Uh, Michael? I guess I have a question about uh, the different consortia that are evolving in North America and the United States. 
have they looked to, I mean, has there been much correlate in terms of what the European models are? What are the, the Bologna Accords? What are the pan-EU uh, assessment groups? Has there been, you know, that seems to be about a decade ahead of us. Um, is there much leading back and forth that way? I'm going to have to plead ignorance. I don't know if you all learn anything about that. At the, at the uh, no, I, I'll have to plead ignorance on that as well. But but it's a it's certainly something I think that will be a topic of my evening reading. In this yeah, I don't know. Coming week that in? I don't know you know, whether they mm -hmm. that how much that influenced the formation. I don't look. I have to admit I don't recall. Uh, you know, reading the leap report originally or having looked at it periodically over the years, seeing that. Uh, reference to it, so. It's just that we're there about a decade further along. I think there's well, probably much to be learned of where the Qatar's are, where, mm -hmm. you know, where, where the future. Where well, you? Um, the Bologna Accord was being implemented when I was on sabbatical in Europe, and, so I, and I was at a university, and um, my impression is the Bologna Accord was really trying to make European universities more like the American universities. Mm -hmm in a sense, because in Europe, you could not transfer credits you know, across universities. You can transfer credits within the university across departments. Um, so that it was really more a process of standardizing you know, what are the standards that are to be met so that if someone from Spain is gonna go and take a class in Germany, um, you know, those credits will transfer and the, 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 uni the Spain, Spanish university will know what they're gonna get in German, in but, Germany. But the principal function of that was exactly the mechanisms of assessment that you're discussing here. I'll, you know, I, I fully understand the context right. of what, why that evolved, the transferability across the EU. Mm -hmm. However, this issue, in many ways, you can see a similar type of what's the common language, what are the anticipations, how do we work outside of our disciplines to meet. So I strongly would recommend it. I'd actually say that that's one of the benefits I see of going through this, I, maybe not this specific mm -hmm. part, but just going through this uh, values uh, assessment within our department, is that uh, we would talk about things like you know, critical thinking and all that, but I don't think we were saying the words in the same way. You know? And the fact that now we have these rubrics and these definitions, so, so now when we're talking about well, what are we doing in critical thinking? We're actually at least closer to speaking the same language. Yeah. Can I, can I just, uh, I think that's the idea of common language, I guess, is really a, a appealing. In terms of challenges to implementation, at least in written communication, um, for me, since we're talking about juniors and seniors, it's a really diffuse nature of writing instruction uh, at, the, at the upper class level. Um, there's a great deal of writing instruction that is going on in classes that are not designated writing intensive. Uh, and probably in a couple of cases, the converse is also true. Yep. Um, too often, you know, the matter of getting a real handle on disciplinary conventions is still too often a matter of who advises your capstone um, or what goes on in the particular section of a WI class you end up in. So there's not really a, a substantial or robust culture of disciplinary writing conventions. Yeah. On the other hand, it's helpful for our students to hear the same language from different people multiple times. So it's possible that if we all are talking about the same things, if we are all using, uh, using words like genre and disciplinary conventions, if we're all talking about uses of sources and evidence, it's possible that a culture could emerge from that shared vocabulary and not the other way around. Um, how much, when designing assessment plans, how much emphasis is being placed on before-after assessment as opposed to gauging it against uh, you know, some golden standard? Because in theory it's possible that people are literate, but did they learn it here? Or on the opposite, they might not be quite up to the standard, but it was a dramatic improvement in four years. Yeah. So how, how is it that ready? I mean, well, you were an analogy. Sure. So um, I think, again, to be clear, the, the involvement in this, this is a pilot study. 
And as a pilot study, uh, one of its primary pieces is proof of concept. Proof of concept that the value rubrics, as they were written, can actually be scaled in a way that can that, that they can function as a, a tool for assessment. I mean, th that really is the foundational, uh, you know, kind of premise of this of this study. So this is a first step. Um, I think what you'll see in the future are subsequent steps to do exactly that, which is to say not just at the junior year, where are you? But then to introduce at the beginning of your academic career, where are you? And then again towards the end. And so this mirrors a lot of processes that are already in place on this campus in terms of within departments to think about where are our, our incoming students? And then what kinds of competencies do they then demonstrate in their capstone projects? And so, but, but for the purposes of this particular pilot, they're focused on that junior year attainment because that junior year attainment corresponds with being considered competent or being considered proficient against these rubrics. So that, that's the basic logic of this. And so this is sort of a part one of a to be continued kind of a process. I, I will say this is a comment. I think it's a, yours is a great question. And it's, a, it's a, one of the challenging ones. If we really want to say, well, we want students to develop some competencies and we could you know, somehow ma measure that perfectly validly, then yeah, we ought to administer this perfect valid assessment to every student coming in and say, hey, you're pretty good there. You don't have to take this. You, you've already met these criteria. You don't really need to take 120 credit hours. You can forget these credit hours. You know, I think we're a long way from that. <laughs> but it is an interesting implication of, of looking at this. I and mean, we all know, you take math as an example. I mean, some of our students come in are ready to go into calculus too. And some of our students coming in, well, less well trained in math. Marie, you have a question. Yeah, um, I, I, my question is procedural. Huh? It's not really clear um, how many of these students are actually going to there's a lot of buzz terms coming through that I don't think we've read the reports sufficiently enough to kind of understand what the concept is. But the idea I'm confused about is, so you just mentioned junior standing. Is that when the evaluation is or when the pre-evaluation is? Uh, there's no pre-evaluation. All right, so that's the evaluation? Yep. So I'm very afraid of that because I think in our university, it's really when the students get to the senior year that the, the tenured faculty are pretty much in charge of them. And there gets to be these intense capstone two-year experiences in our department. I know other departments do the same. And that's when we start to, I think, unthread some of the things that have been poorly <coughs> threaded and, and go at it again. And then by the time we get through capstone, we're, we're beating it. It, it. We've got it. We've gotten the benefits of the weaknesses they had early on having to do with often too many lecturers, not coordinated, not attending faculty meetings because we have these fiscal problems of having students that are taking <laughs> courses from people that aren't necessarily meeting with the departments on a monthly basis to discuss strategies, syllabi, learning goals. And I think maybe you're suggesting we're going to revamp that. We're going to readdress this lack of coordination when we have so many different lecturers and then a few faculty that are finishing the job. So I think we get there and I think I'm really impressed at how fast the students really attain um, the SBA at the end in our system. But I think if we come at it with a junior assessment that that would be not in our best interest. So how can we take the system we have and uh, uh, maybe make it possible in the University of Maine uh, which is probably similar to many of these state universities uh, to uh, achieve a junior assessment that would be uh, reasonable and make us look that we're meeting LEAP and NEAS goals. I mean, I would say at the end of the senior year it might work better. Okay, well, actually, I should have added two key words. At least junior year. We're not so it could well be we're senior, not senior level or senior, okay. could be capstone courses. Okay. I, so key, two key words that <laughs> totally change <laughs> that. Yeah. At least junior year is what they're saying. So, yeah. And, and I'll just add, I mean, and, and this goes to, I had the very same questions and concerns. And just to reiterate what Brian said, 
uh, the um, multi-state collaborative recognizes that this is really an exercise in trying to figure out how to use these tools and they're fine tuning the tool and the processes. So in this data, they're very careful to say the data that's gonna come out of this is not data that they're gonna want people to use and spread around yet to say this is how we're doing. They're really trying to study the process and the, the goal is to get the kinks worked out of it so that then there is a good system and then we can design it how we would like. And I would think, uh, you know, just hearing from the two of you and, and other faculty that to me it seems like you want an initial assessment and an end term assessment and that's going to make the good picture and we would be able to do that but first we're just trying to figure out is this the type of process that we want to use in order to be able to do that and that's what the MSC is trying to study and then you know they're gonna say now let's uh, let the institutions flexibly fix this according to their needs so I mean and we actually for our programmatic assessment uh, we you know we were playing with those things mm -hmm. and adding that before component did make a dramatic difference you know the picture yeah. Yeah. is different from yeah. what uh, we originally thought yeah. it was. Uh, yeah, Emily, you had your hand up there? Can I just talk, say that the value rubrics, I've been reading a lot about it because I'm going to attend this conference with them, they are currently designed to have a benchmark and then a follow on So I know on this particular thing that we're going to go through in February, that is what we're going to do. We're just going to assess the pending product. That sort of gets out of all these things right. that we all are asking. They're already kind of set up that way. Yeah, you know, we got to figure this out thoughtfully. Uh, are we getting at the right sort of data? Well, I just have a follow-up. They, uh, you know, I think I, I get that part. But one of my concerns is that what we consider quantitatively literate isn't just the minimum that we require for everybody in the end, but the requirements we would have for an electrical engineer or somebody in economics. One presumes are more than, say, Michael would require of students in art. One presumes. Um, and is the procedure that one is looking at the MSC, you know, capable of refining that and seeing? to what extent we are measuring the thing we would like to measure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, I, and I, again, I think part of it is to think about what is the function of our involvement. Um, from the MSC's perspective, the function of our involvement is to help provide a broader base of institutional data about how this works, given what their studies questions are. Mm -hmm. And that is essentially proof of concept. And the, the function, or the functioning rather, of these rubrics as a methodology to assess those outcomes. Do they actually function? From my perspective, from I think our perspective, I think the function of our involvement is to learn about what, what parts of this process um, are likely to work in the longer term for the University of Maine, and what are the, what are the gaps, what are the holes, that remain and things that will yet to be addressed. Um, but it's, it, it, to me, it's a way for us to do it with a set of scaffolds in place in terms of the kinds of other institutions and their experiences, the data that they provide, uh, also their comments and their experiences, the barriers that they face as well as ours, so that as we're thinking about our own process, we have the opportunity to learn along with others uh, so that when we make our next steps, perhaps they're slightly more informed than they might be otherwise. That, that, that to me, is the, the function of this. So this may be just a different version of Marie's and Nigel's concerns, but I wonder if we're being maybe a little overly optimistic about existing assignments actually fitting the rubrics well enough that we get good data as a result of that. Um, whether, regardless of, of which of the three student learning outcomes one is looking at. Um, my experience with assessment would suggest that if your, if your assignments are designed to pick up particular traits that you get a better feel for how well students have succeeded in acquiring those traits and that if we choose if, if there is not an effort to match assignments to aspects of a rubric then we may either uh, overestimate or probably much more commonly underestimate our students actual accomplishment because we aren't asking them to produce what it is that we're looking for 
and th this isn't really about you know teaching to a test it's more do we have a match between the rubric and the artifact well, I, I, that's again the challenge we bring to the faculty is to help figure that out is it, <coughs> do we have it if we do how, what, how do we know and how do we select those assignments yeah. it seems essential from the reading um, that the, the materials on the yeah. website I mean, they talk about that as the issue and that that's part of the expertise that they bring to the table is they're going to, you know, we may bring forward <coughs> certain artifacts for them and they'll s say, oh, with this rubric? Oh, okay, and then they're going to help us identify where we're not matching, mm -hmm. you know, right? Well, if, and can I add in that when, when, I think when you say when they, what they really mean is we. So Kirsten, Patty, and I are going out as scorers to St. Louis or to uh, Kansas City rather in a couple of weeks along with about 450 other folks from these other institutions to sit and use these rubrics and go through and provide feedback and talk about alignment of, of, of individual kinds of projects and provide that feedback to institutions. So, I mean, getting involved with this is just part of tapping into all of that, to that knowledge base and in a really systematic way. Um, but again, we can take it or leave it in the end. Um, but again, it's just a chance to learn. I guess for me, one of the exciting opportunities here is that, that opportunity for faculty to um, have this framework within which to apply their their own creativity in designing assignments and, and to kind of make make these judgments and so if, if that's the framework in which we can do this then we have a really wonderful opportunity for our faculty to to uh, exercise that creativity and that that teaching judgment uh, in, a, in a very kind of in a way that's that's well framed to get us to the institutional goals we have I, first of all, I don't mean to don't we do that already? Don't we have that creativity within our disciplines to look at ourselves in our you know, respective grander arenas, in my case, the humanities, whatever? I'm not sure what value we're getting from this that we don't already have. I think we need be a bit more realistic about what this type of large assessment data collection, we're crafting a wonderfully sharp dual-edged weapon. We can use it very strongly for ourselves to get outside of our disciplines, look at how we are working in the greater arenas of liberal arts education, okay? But I think we're naive if we don't think that we are crafting a tool that will be then applied to us. Uh, no, to us, I'm not gonna use the word against us, in a, in a national scale. I mean, that is one of the reasons I bring up the Bologna, because it did some wonderful things, but it also, caused a lot of disenfranchisement. So, I mean, there are distinct advantages of this, and I, I, I don't want to be against participation in this, because I think the conversations can be extremely healthy in terms of, you know, what, what means of commonality do we have, what common goals we have. But I, I do think we have to be cautious and not naive about where, this, where other parts of this could land. Yeah, Michael, you're a skepticism is healthy and and I think rightly put and I would share it except for the reaction that we've gotten already from NEASC and the other regional accreditors so that they're famously agnostic with respect to how we arrive at the content that meets any given standard so they'll say please show us that you're that you're uh, that you are uh, assessing and evaluating quantitative literacy but they don't say whether you do it in a math class or whether you do it two years later down the road, Nigel, <clears throat> as it's manifested in one of Mario's courses or elsewhere. The regional accreditors are also um, historically very wary of nationalizing efforts because if there were one standard and one accrediting body, there would be no need for them. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I tend to respond uh, at, by taking their temperature on initiatives just like this. They have very strongly, NEASC in particular, but other regional creditors as well, uh, endorsed this in part because it makes up for what they don't do, which is uh, show us the path that takes us to the fulfillment of the standard. What they frequently get back from universities like ours, especially for people like Brian and, and I who have to write assessment reports 
uh, when we ask them, how is it specifically that we show that we've met the standard, uh, what we often get back is, well, that's not what we deal with. They don't deal with it in part because they have so many different institutions of so many different kinds that, that, are, that are bound by that standard. So I guess what I'm saying is, um, that this is designed to lead, I believe, to the opposite of a nationalizing, but rather better local knowledge of the kind that Dylan was talking about, and yet informed by a, an aggregated body of information and, and assessment data that we can all draw from, as Brian has been stressing, for our own purposes and to the benefit of our own university. Okay, I, I, I don't wish to come across as skeptical <coughs> in any way, shape, or form. I do think there's much positive to be within this. And I would encourage us to think of how this allows us to protect, to present a public face of what a university education is. In other words, I can see this as a very useful exercise for us to be making arguments within the public mm -hmm. arena for, our, for what we believe in. When I use the term national, please don't take it so literally. Um, what I mean is any type of, when we use the term benchmark, standard, imagine getting friendly advice back of, can you rethink your discipline to be meeting these things? And we get a little bit toward where Emily is pointing. Is there necessarily that correspondence? So I don't want to come across as skeptical. I want to be positive about this and fully do <coughs> engagement. I would look for the opportunities of what this will give us. But I would, but again, I, I would be wide open eyes. Go ahead. You talked about the pilot and the assessment. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about the larger framework, the larger picture of the foundational area? So are you saying at this point that the gen eds are equivalent to our foundation no, no, Not necessarily, no. I mean, the, the two of the three are obvious. That, that, that this pilot is first interested in writing competency and quantitative literacy. <coughs> you know, that, that maps perfectly on, on to our uh, our gen ed. I think from having it again from the from the October um, uh, discussion we had, when we asked faculty to look at. They saw a significant overlap between these uh, these areas uh, and, and our gen ed. So as I've talked, I think I may have lost track of your question. So <laughs> well, I just I wanted to hear a little bit more about <laughs> the concept of foundational areas oh, because the of how, of how, yeah, how it came out, the signature yeah. emerging, and then no, the actually that's a great. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So that that's to me that uh, remains. Um, you know, a challenge. Uh, I think it's one of these things that we all think we know what they are. And again, for myself, speaking for myself, when I look at the the uh, league um, learning outcomes, I say, yeah, that, that looks that looks good. Um, I you know I uh, I think in terms of our um, um, I think I would myself prefer to have the discussion and not tie it to our Gen Ed requirements. Um, to have the discussion about what they are uh, over here, and then ask the question: How does I, from, from my point of view, is how do our gen ed requirements and everything else we're doing here at UMaine help achieve these outcomes? I, I don't I personally. This is my my choice. I don't think. I think we're making a mistake if we think the gen ed requirements by themselves are going to achieve meaningful outcomes. So, to me, they're part of the puzzle uh, about this. So I'm. A, that was, and I, I'm not avoiding, but I'm, I don't have an answer to your question about what's the mechanism for making sure we've identified what are the foundational areas at the, at the University of Maine. But I think I sparked questions from the chairs of English and Maine. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, just to follow up rather than the question, you know, I'd like to add, I think this is all a very good initiative, and I certainly think we should be on board with it. Um, but what you just said, I wanted to query a little bit. Uh, I think for the pilot program, uh, quantitative literacy and gen ed is a great starting point, but I don't quite agree with you that it's an exact match for what they're measuring because, as you said earlier, if we're to be looking at quantitative literacy as, say, an electrical engineering junior has it, uh, or as a psychology junior has it, that's not quite the same thing as a, as, as a quantitative literacy that we're putting in as a requirement for everybody across the board, yeah. and probably shouldn't be measured as such. No, I, I think that's not. I, I, what I think what I was trying to convey is that I, I believe when the discussions about gen ed were first taking place, it was we need to make sure our students are quantitatively literate. Okay, great. And then we operationalize that in certain ways by having checkoffs and stuff, which I'm not 
you know, it was very debatable about whether that's a good methodology or not. But we did it, so did hundreds of other universities, so I don't think we're unusual. But it's a, it's a you know, it's an interesting question about, well, just as I think Kristen said in the, in, the, in the taped piece from last time in October, if we think our job is done because they've checked off, you know, I don't think any of us thinks that's adequate. Dick? I mean, this is a really stupid question, but what data are we getting? What kinds of data? I don't understand. There's a lot of talk about data, but what's being measured? I think the art, I mean, if I answer your question, they use the term artifact, so there would be sample papers that be identified <coughs> and they're sent and they're evaluated on these rubrics. And they'll be rated and, one to five on a rubric? Uh, essentially, a, a, a one to four. four. Uh, one to four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That one to four is probably a very bad measure because, well, no, that's fine. A to D, that's about as far as So we submit our assignments and then they get rated one, two, three, four. Yeah, and again, as was been said, the point is can this be done reliably? Is there validity to this? It's, a, it's really a pilot to, uh, to develop an assessment measure. It's, at this point, the pilot's not going to feed back to us and say, hey, you're doing all right here, you may, you're not doing so well there. It's helping to develop a tool that, again, to follow on Dylan and Brian's point, we can or cannot, if we choose not, but we can take that back to you, May, and say, how can this help us with our task of, of really learning whether we're achieving the goals we think we are at you, May? So it's a step. In. I mean, the, if the one, two, three, four would be something like, you know, um, f four would be, you know, uh, excelling three would be uh, meet standards, you know, or, or something like that. And it would be along a series of questions. So if it's within qualitative literacy, it would be, you know, questions such as, is the student able to, um, you know, uh, assess the reliability of sources? Is this, does the student show um, connections in, you know, thoughts and arguments uh, in accord with the thesis proposed? You know, so th there would be some meaningful things. It wouldn't be just like, oh, we think this student gets a three on this paper. Um, it, it, it has some <coughs> more meat to it than that. Michael? The student papers being created, not the assignments? Right. The, um, if I understand the question, you would give the uh, assignment, what the nature of the assignment was, and then you would upload along with the nature of that assignment and the assignment given, you know, 20 student, you know, papers or 20 student um, exams or whatever the particular um, matching student work is that corresponded to the assignment given. I think, I think to clarify though, this is not a single grade. I mean, from everything I saw of the data that you sent, you know, the sites you sent us to, this is a matrix of one to four on 20 different questions. Yes. Yes. And that, I, I think that's, I'm about to use the word sussing. That sussing out of data, I mean, I think that's where we can start actually having the conversation of what we value within. And this is where I think it can be beneficial. Again, this also is good for establishing a vocabulary for public discourse. And, and if I can just add, I mean, this is where I, I agree with you. I mean, I have, as much as I think this is a great way to go, I am just as nervous as many other people about what does this do for us and is it just going to be extra work? And I want this to be something that actually helps me uh, if I'm going to do it. I don't, again, want it to just be checking off the box. So what I'm hoping is, you know, as I look at the LEAP values and the value rubrics associated with them, I think, yeah, I, I want my students to be learning this. I want my students to be learning this. And I'm hoping that it will offer me the opportunity to look at assignments which I already think are good and that I think, you know, I'm being creative and responsibly crafting an assignment. Of course I think that. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that there might be an opportunity when using these value rubrics, value rubrics to say, well, wait a second, am I really crafting an assignment that is as strong as it could be in helping my students become, you know, stronger, people for their own lives, citizenship, and, you know, and you know, the workforce, whatever work is valuable and important to them. So I don't know, maybe that is uh, overly optimistic, but I sure hope it does that, because I don't want to be just pushing paper at all. So I'm, I'm with you on that, and I feel like this has the possibility of doing that good work, not just check boxes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing up here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mindful of our time. I'll let Nate make one more comment, and then I'll try to wrap things up. Oh, just a quick one. There's a lot of discussion. A lot. 
Oh, I'm sorry. There's a lot of discussion of assignments, and I'm just wondering um, how does assessing assignments relate to potentially assessing programs? Uh, I mean that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. They don't seem like the same thing. And no, I'm just yeah, curious about how that's thing. discussed. I mean, that's clearly, again, it's this idea of can we help develop a tool? Can we learn from that that we can use here at UMaine? And then those are the kind of questions we have to grapple with as a, as a community. Is this a useful tool to help us in evaluating a program? Uh, and, and I'm not sure of the answer to that, but uh, yeah. it potentially. And it's along the lines that Michael maybe was suggesting that we have to be mindful what are we getting into and. Uh, um, you know and how potentially it could be used again. I'm going to argue that there's there's the positives. I think I heard you say the same thing. The positives, the potentials are all very good here. We just want to be mindful uh, that we don't you know we don't develop a tool and beat ourselves over the head with it. That's, uh, that's not our goal. So, all right, Mike, I'll let you make comments. Uh, I'd argue that baseline data would be more useful if it could be somehow identifiable such that we could identify characteristics of students in combination with characteristics of uh, curricular programs that make for achievement or not. So the, so the next challenge, uh, not the next one, what is the next thing we need to do is figure out how to do this. Um, you know, we have this outline of, of a plan. So what I'm going to ask um, is, um, I, and I should have said this at the outset, you may have noticed there's a camera over there, we're making a recording of this. Uh, we'll, we'll post this on, uh, there's a site on, on my web, the Provost website, um, about this. There's also there, though, you know, we've uploaded materials about, uh, about the LEAP project, about the value rubrics, that some of you have looked at it. Um, and we will add, uh, a place for people to add thoughts and comments and directions. So I encourage you to do that. I'd also encourage you to sh let your colleagues know, uh, you know, that we're engaging in this and that uh, if they can put any time and thought into it, we'd appreciate their, their input. I, 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 um, what I'd like to do is figure out a way, and I'll, I'll talk with, uh, with uh, Mick Peterson as president and Maria as uh, chair of the Economic Affairs Committee about how do, how do we go about you know, reaching out and engaging the faculty in this uh, practically, who we're going to identify, how we're going to do this. I, I don't have the answer to that, but I look forward to working uh, with the Senate uh, uh, on doing that. I want to uh, I thank everyone to come, for coming here, but I particularly want to thank my boss. I think it's very, she said something about the value of our president that she'd want to come in and, and sit in on this kind of a of conversation. Uh, so. Um, Thank you, uh, President Hunter, for joining us. If you'd like to share a few comments, you're welcome to do that. And I won't take up much time because I know everybody really needs to go. So I found this very helpful. Jeff talked to me a while ago, a couple weeks ago, really, about the collaborative. And, and just two, two thoughts. The first is I think this is a, a great opportunity for us to participate, not because it's meant to be prescriptive. We're not getting, going to hear back things that, that are telling us what we need to do as much as I think all of you who will be the participants might get information that just as you said, you know, you sort of thought you were right on top of something and gee, I could tweak that a little bit. So that's where I see this and I also, I really, although two of the three certainly line up with Gen Ed, I see it as the upper level competency that is what we're really after. So, you know, what does quantitative literacy look like in a fourth year mathematics major, not in someone who's taken the lowest level course in mathematics or anything else. I mean, and so I'm, I'm not picking on mathematics, but you know, that's the idea that as we look across the curriculum and look at all of our programs, how do these competencies play out at the, at the near the end stage of the student's academic history? And I also think, Andre, great point. The, the beginning and end, the before and after testing which I guess maybe a lot of biologists do, so that resonates with me. So thank you. Yeah. Again, thank you very much for participating. We'll send out a little notice about, hey, here's the website, and try to make it easy for faculty uh, to give input. So again, thanks a lot for coming. And, uh, thank you guys very much. And so